Morning. Uh, this is week 14. Heavens, week 14. Talking to John at your session for theory four, number one. Hopefully, this time I'll be able to upload both things uh, with more time during the week. Uh, oh, by the way, if you're having a little bit of trouble uh, getting your assignments in this week, I won't actually start, I won't look at them really until probably until about Thursday. So since I was a little slow, slower than I would have liked to have been uh, getting your homework, et cetera, et cetera, and lectures to you next week, I'll give you, a, yeah, you can, if you get them to me by Thursday, I will, uh, I will not look terribly askance, although really you should have been working on them so that you would have them done today. However, that's the way it goes. All right, today uh, I want to cover the last, uh, the last chapter of the K and P book. You know the one that costs you and is a real pain, and because of that, and we'll go over that. Uh, we'll go over that in a little bit of detail, not a whole lot. Uh, chapter twenty is really sort of um, sort of a context thing. Uh, at least in terms of this class, it sort of provides, sort of fills in some, uh, lets you, informs you about some movements in uh, composition and music theory in the 20th century, and in the 20th and 21st century, for that matter. Pardon me, I've got a, I don't know whether I've had a cold or whatever it is. I'm seeing at the sniffles this morning. Uh, but we'll talk about those uh, sort of general context things that I would strongly recommend that you have in the back of your mind to sort of uh, think about and research a little bit more throughout the, the, uh, the, uh, the, your, your musical careers. Uh, I also need to talk to you a little bit about the uh, exam. If I do this right. Yes, pardon me. Pardon me. I forgot. I was going to do this. Yes. Talk to you about the exam. <laughs> That's coming up at the end of the term. Uh, I've just kind of sort of started to think about that, and, um, so, and I'll give you more details on the exam. <laughs> as they congeal into my head. Uh, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about that today, but I'll give you more details uh, as, as we go along. Uh, I also, uh, going on for the rest of the, the rest of the class, and I will also uh, talk a little bit in some detail about the, uh, the last Schubert thing that I gave you. That thing from the, the, the 12th of the 12 Grazer waltzes. And if, in case you're wondering where that word, where that title comes from, Grazer Walze, uh, Graz, G R A T Z, or as we in Canadians, as we, as, as we in, as I, as, as a loyal Canuck would say in Canuck speak, say, G R A Z, Graz, is a suburb of Vienna, uh, which if I'm remembering correctly, it's, it's, it's near Vienna, so it's a town near Vienna, uh, that Schubert, as well as other composers and intellectuals, would, would visit occasionally. And I think there might have been some sort of a spa or something that people would go to there. I can't remember what it was. Yeah, sort of, a, sort of like a, um, sort of like a Mar-a-Lago way east, only except without the, well, let's not get into that. All right, I've attempted and have succeeded largely in keeping my politics out of this. All right, so that's what we'll do today. I'm going to talk a little about that. Okay, uh, let's, let's say we talk a little about the exam uh, first. Um, as you know, uh, due, to, uh, due to the circumstances that we're dealing with and the times being what they are, uh, this will all be uh, sent to you electronically. Uh, if I'm, and I'm thinking it will probably be, I will send it out on the Friday 
the last Friday of, 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 of classes. And you will have until 3.30 uh, of the Wednesday of exam week uh, to get everything finished for me and to me by 3.30. Yeah, that's when the exam, if we were having it in situ or at, on location, that's when it would be over. So I need these things by 3.30 on Wednesday, the Wednesday of exam week. Okay, and you're going to have all kinds of time to work on this to get this all done. Yes, you will. That is if you, that is if you work on it in a timely fashion. Uh, and, and some of you, that... Well, just ain't necessarily so. Uh, so anyway, there will be some kind of an analysis. Uh, I haven't quite totally decided what I'm going to give you, but it will probably be a page from a violin sonata by Mozart. So that you have to deal with the piano part as well as the violin part while working through this. Uh, it may be that, uh, it's just I'm not quite sure, it's either a sonata or a set of variations, or the, the theme of a set of variations for violin and piano by Mozart. Definitely by Mozart, unless I change my mind, uh, and it'll be, it'll be about, a, about, a, about a page long, something like that. I'll prob I might structure it in such a way that you have to answer specific questions and about all of the page, and then you, but you won't have to thoroughly write out an analysis of all the measures, right? Probably like one or two systems or so that you'll have to provide a detailed analysis of. Okay, uh, there will be a little bit of part writing. Uh, that part writing will more than likely come straight out of your book. Uh, so if I, if you wanted to get a little bit of practice, and it wouldn't hurt some of it would wouldn't hurt a lot of some of you all any of you and some of you a lot more than many of you to get a little practice on this I would say like uh, do, you know if you go back and sort of work through a few of the um, the part writing examples uh, from you know like chapters like chapters you know, sorry, chapters 20 21 22 something like that I'll give you a little bit of something there uh, it'll be in four parts, uh, and you'll have it'll, you'll be given uh, probably a baseline, and which you uh, elaborate in a four-part style, the way we have been since forever, or since wet way into the uh, early parts of the first term of this whole exercise. Uh, which, by the way, I must say, over overall, you've worked very hard and come a long way. Congratulations on that, and. Keep it up. Uh, so, a part writing and analysis. Uh, a few weeks ago, I gave you ten listening examples uh, from your theory book to be able to recognize. Uh, so, you know, I could very easily, like, maybe provide, you know, set up a, a set up part of the exam as, uh, you know, I could say, uh, like, maybe play you. Electronically, of course, um, maybe six or seven of those, and you can. I would require you to tell me who the composer was, the title of the piece, and or uh, what that what particular uh, what particular aspect of 20th century composition uh, it's an example of that kind of thing. That would be something that would be easy to do. Uh, and easy for me to mark, so I would strongly recommend that you go back and listen to those a, a number of times. Make sure you know how to spell the composer's name, know what the title of the piece is, and know what it's an example of, say like an example of polytonality, or whatever else, right? So that kind of, or I think they use additive rhythms or something, I can't remember what, what they all are. But that would be something that would be very reasonable for me to expect you to know how to do. And as always, I will concoct a, few, a page or two, page and a half, page two and a half pages or so of sort of short answer questions, which I will expect you to be able to 
answer. Um, yeah, and those can include like the questions I've been giving you up till now, and that can also include like maybe uh, you know uh, taking the fully diminished seventh chord and rewriting it so that all of its in all of its in all of its possible leading tones are used as the root of the chord. I could also ask you to all to you know to to make turn that into a five seven of whatever and rewrite it as a German sixth in some key. I could ask you to do stuff like that. So basically uh, that exam is going to essentially be in the exact same format covering the exact same types of material that I've always been asking you about and that we've always, always been covering in class. Because I'm, I, I, I try very hard to not fool people on exams. The last thing that a, a, a final exam or any exam or any any graded uh, piece of material that you get from any class, there should be no trick questions. There should be no fooling of, of the student. And I try very hard to not do that. Okay? All right, so, and more specific information about the exams. Hang on a second, I gotta do this again. Uh, fine, yeah, here we go. Exam. Final. <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. I'll give you more details on that as the as the week per, as the week and weeks progress. Okay. Uh, chapter twenty-eight. New directions. This is uh, five eighty-three. Uh, the curious dichotomy of twentieth-century music. Uh, because there is an ex in this 20th century, you, ex you you find two things: an extension of post-romantic tendencies, and as well as a conscious and at times almost militant attempt to establish a totally new musical language. So it's so that's something that you'll notice in 20th century music. Uh, there is an expansion of textural and instrumental resources, as well as compositional techniques, including chants and process material, process procedures, and all, as well as the implications of technology. And as you know, uh, particularly when studying at Lewis, that we are technology heavy. There's a lot of technology at use. Uh, in music these days. But it's important to keep in mind, and as I've, I've tried to stress through these four semesters, that technology has always been very, very part and parcel with music and the developments of music. Uh, for instance, uh, Mr. Gordon can attest to this, uh, the, uh, the repertoire for the horn uh, was influenced greatly by the invention in the early 19th century of the valve which created, which, which gave the opportunity to the horn to play a lot more notes than just the notes of the chromatic, of not the chromatic, but of the harmonic series, uh, stuff like that. So this, and the uh, church organs of the Baroque are highly sophisticated, complicated pieces of machinery that need to be taken care of. As for that matter, is the development of the forte piano uh, is also a fascinating uh, study uh, when looking at the history of the development of technology in music. You know, it's actually kind of interesting that, uh, did you know uh, that the, uh, the invention of the uh, piano happened just about the same time, yeah, just about the same time as the development of the automobile. That's a rather interesting. Uh, that's a rather interesting development, and the development of the modern piano, per se, the, the what that's, that's, that we gradually come to know as the piano, uh, really started like around the around the time of the Civil War in this country. So that's kind of interesting. And also, Gustav Mahler was born. Uh, was it the same year as the war broke out? I can't remember what it was. So it's important to keep that in mind. Okay, uh, so uh, the next section is about the ex explorations of texture, 
timbre and tuning. Uh, there is a renewed and practical interest in chamber music. Um, chamber music, especially during the war years, uh, around 19, around from 1914 to 1918, it was extremely difficult, what with the war, to, to get large ensembles of, mu of musicians together to practice. So, and especially, uh, and especially Stravinsky uh, took it, uh, was affected by that, and his, uh, his, uh, 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 his, the, uh, the, uh, the 1913 orchestra piece, Le Sacre du Printemps, or the Rite of Spring was for a huge orchestra. But during the Second World War, he didn't have, not the First World War, and Second World War, as far as that goes, the resources were far, far, far less common. So a lot of chamber ensembles, were, uh, ch chamber music, and music for solo instruments uh, was, uh, was, was written during the time. Uh, for, for instance, like this, uh, Stravinsky's L'Histoire du Soldat, or The Soldier's Tale, is for a chamber uh, or a chamber ensemble and a speaker. Okay, uh, and also there are a lot of interesting explorations of new ways of playing the piano, uh, playing uh, traditional instruments. Um, not the least of which were the experimentations by people like John Cage and other experimentalist composers uh, who worked with something. The idea of the idea of taking the, pe the, the strings of a piano and putting various things in between them uh, at various points uh, to alter the sound of the piano. So that's something called prepared piano. Prepared piano and the, um, the sonatas and interludes of John Cage for prepared piano. Uh, Jack, I played you one or two of these things in orchestration in history class and willing history class at least. Uh, uh, those, those I think are really rather interesting. Uh, another person who was very, very interested in the use of the prepared piano, another American composer uh, named George Crum, uh, who I actually met. And on meeting him, the uh, description that my, my theory teacher in undergraduate school was confirmed that, oh, Crum, yeah, he's just an old, old Virginia hillbilly. And it's true. He's a. It's a. When you talk to George Crumb, it would be very. You 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 could very easily get the. Oh, this is just a plain old, you know, plain ordinary friendly fellow from somewhere in, down south. Very 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 nice man, uh, but a re but a really 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 interesting composer uh, of compositions. And uh, example twenty eight point one is the magic circle of infinity. Uh, is taken from his uh, his piano cycle, the Macrocosmos, uh, which again is a series of I think it's twelve pieces uh, for prepared piano. And Macrocosmos, uh, the the title of that is derived from and is a reference to Bartok's Microcosmos, a set of I want to say it's six volumes of graded piano pieces that we talked a little about earlier in the term. And as a matter of fact, there is at least one Bartok listening example that you're supposed to know from those ten listening examples that I could very easily put on the exam. Hint. 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 Okay, uh, the percussion. Uh, the percussion uh, family uh, received a huge, huge influx of not only new instruments, but lots of new music being specifically written for percussion ensembles. Percussion uh, ensembles of instruments made up of just just, in, just various types of percussion instruments. Uh, and this is on page 536 of your book. Uh, the role of percussion was greatly expanded in the 20th century. One of the earliest landmarks in this field is Verez's ionization or ionization. Uh, and in addition to the regular instruments of uh, percussion instruments, it's scored for anvils, uh, sleigh bells, high and low siren, wiro, castanets, maracas, slapstick, cowbell, more cowbell, I need more cowbell, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And those are, that's a very interesting piece. Uh, 
Varez, interestingly enough, uh, worked with Frank Zappa when uh, they, I'm not quite sure what exactly they did together, but Zappa and uh, Zappa and Varez worked closely together for a while. Um, another, uh, we're coming back to Cage again. Cage was also very, very, very important, uh, had a very strong influence on the development of 20th century and 21st century uh, percussion music. Uh, his constructions in metal uh, are very, very, very interesting. Uh, they use things like, uh, they use exotic instruments like thunder sheets, uh, ox bells, Japanese temple bells, Turkish cymbals, water gongs, string piano, and yes, even a few break drums. Yeah, the break drum actually became something of a something of an instrument into into and unto itself uh, in the uh, 20th century. And as a matter of fact, I can show you. This is a an example. This is a, my one of my copies of the my orchestration book that I'm teaching Jack from. And if you look, there's a uh, there is a somewhere in here, somewhere in here in the percussion section. Oddly enough. <laughs> Of a picture, uh, let's see, a picture of of orcs of 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 of, of pitched uh, of pitched uh, pitched percussion instruments that include. Find it here. Where are you at? Find it. Let me find it here. Worst comes to worst, look it up. You know, I don't know. Look it up. Hang on. Yeah. I'll tap dance while I do it. Uh, let's see. Where where are you be? Uh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, page 186. Uh, you'll notice that uh, Alfred Blatter in his set, attempt to be complete, uh, 196. We want 186. Hang on a second. Yeah, I don't know whether you'll be actually be able to see it in the picture, but right down there is a break is, is a break drum from I think it's from a 1957 Chevy. Right, so. Uh, Break drums. They have a marvelous bell-like quality, and it's also a great way to just further, uh, further underscore the fact that music majors are crazy when you go around to junkyards looking for stuff like this. And then the guy, what do you want this for? Oh, I'm gonna use it for all of my pieces. Okay, all right. They use that. Uh, they talk about just intonation and various types of tuning, like quarter tones. Uh, that would, of course, be essentially the idea of of a interval smaller than a half tone. So a quarter tone, a half tone would of course be subdivided into two quarter tones. Uh, Harry Parch and other and uh, Henry Cowell, uh, two another two American composers were well known for those. Uh, they talk about uh, proportional notation and graphic notation uh, on page 538. And there is a picture of, a, of an excerpt from uh, one of uh, Christoph Penderecki's work, The Threnody for the Victims of Hiroshima, uh, on page five, two, uh, on page uh, five thirty-seven. That is a kind of graphic score. It's also a very graphic piece in a lot of ways. Then they talk a little about micropolyphony, Sprechstimme, uh, as a kind of vocal technique that was used in the music of Arnold Schoenberg and Alban Berg particularly. Um, and it literally means sp spoken, speaking voice. And if you're interested in finding a little bit of, of want to hear an example of what people think it sounds like, uh, look up Wozzeck or Piero Luner by Schoenberg uh, to get a sense of what that sounds like. Uh, jazz and rock and roll uh, have had, believe it or not, have had a huge influence on uh, on 20th century and 21st century art music. And sorry, uh, I hate to tell you this, but uh, classical music uh, has also had a huge influence on the um, popular music in the 20th century, 
yea, even medieval and uh, Renaissance music, has had a very strong influence, particularly in Britain, on a movement called progressive rock. Uh, there are fascinating examples of the blending of medieval and Renaissance instruments uh, with rock instruments uh, uh, that were taken, uh, that were undertaken by such groups as um, Griffin and various other people. And uh, I would strong and uh, that's very, very interesting. As a matter of fact, the American uh, folk singer uh, Judy uh, Judy Collins uh, recorded a 13th century Italian ballata on one of her best-selling uh, folk music or folk rock music uh, uh, albums. You know it on a CD these days called Wildflowers. Um, I would encourage you to look that up just to sort of get a sense of how much of a, of a cross-fertilization of not only rock, pop music on, on, on classical music, but also on as classical music's influence on popular music in the 20th century, uh, you know, uh, how, much, how much of that has been, how, how that's been very interesting. And don't look so surprised, because practically, if not literally, all blues are based on one, four, five. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. One, four, five. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And one, four, five comes straight out of, you guessed it, 18th and 19th century tonal harmony. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Okay. Uh, then they talk a little bit about indeterminacy or aleatory music. That is the idea of somehow in, uh, somehow incorporating elements of chance. Uh, into the music. Uh, John Cage is well known uh, for this. Um, it's his his music is a little piece called uh, Four Minutes and 33 Seconds, uh, which you can read about on page 539. Uh, they use the term experimental music uh, in, on page 539, so be sure to read about that. Uh, minimalism uh, minimalism is talked a little bit about uh, on page 540 through 541. Uh, minimalism is sort of interesting because uh, in the West, it tends to be associated with uh, secular music, uh, where and it tends to be very repetitive. Well, all music is quite all no, not music, but all all um, all minimalism tends to be. Uh, music that is based on, to use, I think it's Philip Glass's uh, own term, repetitive structures. Uh, very repetitive structures sometimes. Uh, uh, but uh, in the West, it tends to be more towards instrumental music and non-sacred music, whereas in the East, like Europe, and particularly in the Slavic and Russian countries, it tends to be more, tends to be, tends towards more vocal type music and more religious. Uh, uh, in the United States, uh, Terry Riley, who started out as a rock and roll musician, and uh, Philip Glass, who actually uh, started his career in uh, at the University of Chicago writing very, very avant-garde, atonal scores, uh, but gradually switched over to a more minimalist style. Uh, they are well. They are very well known, and that's not to say that that uh, that there is no vocal music in Amer in, in uh, Western in in Western um, minimalism because there's lots of it. As a matter of fact, uh, Glass has written several operas uh, using minimalist uh, uh, techniques. Uh, phasing. They talk a little bit about on page five forty one the idea of the use of a tape loop, tape loop, and other. Uh, music derived from or influenced by mechanical processes. Uh, phasing is an important term that you should know. Um, let's see what else. And again, as you notice, we're going very quickly through this. But I'm expecting you to read this fairly thoroughly because, well, you never know, I might come up with a couple of questions. A couple of questions in your short answer section where you would be good to have looked through this at some depth. Okay, electronic and computer music. Uh, this is on page 545. Uh, the development of new uh, uh, 
uh, electronic musical material and uh, musical instruments, such as the telharmonium, the Ohms Martineau, uh, developed in France, I believe, in the theremin, that was developed by a Russian composer. Uh, tape music, musique concrète, uh, electronic music, all these on page 546, 547, that it wouldn't hurt you to be at least cognizant and uh, not totally ignorant of. Uh, let's see, uh, the advent of the synthesizer is extremely important in 20th century and 21st century art music particularly. Uh, harkening back to like the 1960s, uh, Milton Babbitt's uh, three compositions for synthesizer that were composed, I think, for the Bell Labs uh, in New Jersey, I think it was uh, in the 1960s. Those are very interesting. Uh, and once again, another indication of the role of technology uh, in not just but not just music in the 20th and 21st centuries, but also of, it, of musical musical well since uh, musical instruments began to be created. You know, really. So the idea of technology being married uh, to music is like an idea that's at least 11,000 years old. Okay, so you can read about MIDI, synthesizers, analog, sequencing, that kind of thing. Uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign was very, very important in the beginnings, particularly of experimental computer music. Uh, several of my teachers, Scott Wyatt, uh, John Melby, and various other people, were very, very, very important in that. And then they talk, the last thing they talk about is called a hyper instrument, uh, used to refer to use, use of computers to augment musical expression and creativity. And this is on page 552 of your book. And that essentially gets us through to the end of the book. So, all right, so uh, be reading that, uh, make note of things, and because you never know when I might decide, hmm, that would be a good uh, question to ask them on their final. You know, final. <laughs> cetera, et cetera. Hey, speaking of electronics and technology. Yeah, see? All right, okay, last thing I want to do today is talk a little bit about uh, some aspects of that uh, Grazza Waltz, or the, tw uh, the twelfth of the waltzes that uh, Schubert composed uh, as a set in this little town in, uh, in v near Vienna in Austria. Uh, and uh, sort, of, sort of a general uh, discussion. I thought your analyses uh, were actually quite good. Uh, you're starting to... Uh, you're starting you're starting to uh, think on a larger level and on a deeper level, which is a good thing. Uh, and in order to help you do that, hopefully, uh, I want to talk specifically about the middle third of the piece. And by the middle third of the piece, what I'm talking about is, and I'll show you this, this is the last, this is a blown up copy of the last page of the score. What I'm talking about is the music from the, from there to just about, just about there uh, in the score. So I'll just hold that for a couple of seconds. You take a look at that, and I'll I'll refer to it again uh, as I as my dissertation as my dissertation dissertation like diatribe unfolds. But just take a look at that. Okay. And again, as I said, you got a lot of this, and that's good. And uh, I was expecting that you'd get a lot of it, and you probably wouldn't get all of it because. But then that's, but that's a reflection of where you're at at the moment as theory students. And let me re reiterate that you have come a long way from uh, from the uh, first meeting that we had way back when, back when I was still recovering from my idiocy 
Uh, all right, so take a look at that. Just look through it. First three systems of music uh, completely down to approximately the third measure of the fourth system. Okay, now, get the second page, up, first page up here first. Uh, first page, but where be the first page of it? Where did it go? And of course, I'm not going to be able to find that one, will I? Uh, yeah, figures. Oh, here it is. Yeah, sorry about that. Let me just get some coffee first. Getting uh, refill my coffee mug here. Uh, let's see. It's one of the nice things about pushing at home while doing this. I get to have coffee wherever I want. Then again, if I spill it, I'm the one who's responsible for it. Okay. All right. So. The first one of the questions I asked you was at the beginning, uh, what what key you were in at the end of the first third of the piece, and most of you looked right there. That's where you started looking. And really, what you needed to do was to look at here. Here, looking from there, from the beginning down to the, the, the first repeat sign. Because where you are, actually, is not F-sharp minor, although I can understand why you'd think that, uh, given what's going to come up. You're actually landing. You've actually landed in the dominant of the home key of this particular waltz. You're in E major, and you've actually modulated to B major, which is, again, the dominant. And that's... That is a very, very, very uh, habitual, habitual practice in music of this period. So you're actually starting that particular section in B. All right, I'm going to draw a little rough diagram, which hopefully I can do well enough for you to for you to follow along. So what we're looking at is basically. Hang on a second. So. Right now, where we're at is right just is at the end of the first section, right where uh, the end the the first section's repeat sign happens, and at that point, at that point before the second part of this waltz starts, you are firmly in the key of B major, so that's the key that you're so that's the key that you've landed in. Pardon me. I'm gonna do this wrong. Yeah. I should I should address rehearse this, but I didn't. Sorry. Right. So you're very strongly, you're strongly, strongly, strongly in the key of B major, having modulated from E to B. Hopefully you can see that. Okay. All right. Now let's take a look at take a look at the. Uh, You'll, you'll, let's look again at the, at the first, the, at the, uh, that passage of this piece. Actually, hang on, let me, passage of this piece is what I want to focus on. Uh, you'll notice that each of the measures uh, from the, from just after the, uh, hang on, let me just do this way. Get it right so I can, this way I won't have to keep. This way, I won't have to keep uh, moving it around. You'll notice that in each of these of these measures, from from the from there to the beginning of this second third, down to approximately here, you'll notice that on the first beat of every measure in the bass, you have a B. So in every measure, and this won't necessarily be, I could probably do this right, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 18. Those 18 measures, 
and I've just put hash marks. Hang on a sec. Just, yeah. Technology. Got it. <laughs> Talk about technology. Well, you, you know about me and technology. Not my bestest friend in the world. Um, still write a tonal fugue, though. Somehow, don't ask me why. Don't ask me how I managed to do that. Okay, so each one of those measures has a B pedal point. Let me just sort of give you a little graphic. So, so and it's on the downbeat of each measure. You have this B, B. B, 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 now, B pedal, so B head. So you have this, un you have this, you have this, this quarter note on the first beat of the measure in the, in the bass clef. You've got this B, this B pedal going through this whole thing. So that B pedal. Okay. Now, if you look on the next thing, now, now, so you've got that happening. Now, if you'll look and some of, and now let's look a little bit closer. Let's see if I can get this so you can see it. So I don't have to hold on to it, so you, but you can still see it. Uh, some of you pointed out, and I think quite rightly, in fact, I happen to know quite rightly, uh, you noted the uh, you noted the the presence of E sharps in the first system of the of the second half E sharps, right? And yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right that that though that E sharp <coughs> that E sharp is indeed. E sharp is indeed the leading tone of F sharp minor. That's very true, and you're absolutely right about that. Yeah, and and so I could see how F sharp minor, how F sharp minor could be on your mind <coughs> at the first, at the first, uh, at the first, at the first part of the second section of this piece. So F sharp minor or F sharpness anyway is very important, okay? But you'll notice, and I again I'm gonna have to let's take a second. But you'll notice that what you've got there are is an is a seven fully diminished seven of an E sharp fully diminished seventh chord. So you've got an E sharp fully diminished seventh chord going on in in that section, right? And then if you look uh, in the, so you, that whole thing kind of has sort of a feel to that, but then at the end of that measure, at the end of this system, this system here, you'll notice that you're right back, you're right back on a B chord. As a matter of fact, what you've got there is B, D sharp, F sharp, and A, right? And that, of course, is an, so. So it's so if it does sort of hint around at F sharp minor, it does so well in a not in a in a not in a not completely uh, ambiguous way because of the because of the because of that B pedal point that you've got going on through the whole thing. And that sort of keeps it grounded on the idea of Venus in there. Okay, so it's big, there's a lot, there's a big Venus there. B as in boy. B as in boy. B major. Okay? <laughs> Making sure that that's clear. <laughs> okay. All right, so, so, and then, so right after that, you, you have this, you go right back to a B a B7 chord, right, sort of around here, in that little bit of that, okay? And then uh, you'll notice that uh, in the one, two, three, fourth measure of the second system, fourth measure of the second system, look at the top, look at the, uh, look at the treble clef there, 
what you've got there is A sharp, C, E, and G. So A sharp, C, E, and G. So you've got another fully diminished seventh chord with the root, of course, being A sharp. A sharp thing here. And that also is a fully diminished seventh. That is a fully diminished seventh chord, right? And there you have, and after that, with all this B pedal points going on at the same time, uh, you land on, you land on, you land back, and this is, if you look at the third system, first, me second measure, through to the end of the sec through to the end of that system. Look at that. You notice all you've got there is like a big B chord, big lots of Bs and octaves. Notice the notice the really 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 high register Bs in the right hand, really hammering forth this idea of B. That B. So. So, so it goes back to this sort of B idea again. So sort of a B, and 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 uh, and once again, uh, actually not in that particular section. You've got you've got there is a B chord, is a B chord, and this is not drawn to scale. I didn't get a chance to do this as a practice run. Okay, all right. So, all right now. If you notice, and then after that, after that, what you get is uh, if you look at the if you look at the fourth system, uh, first two measures, first two measures. What you've got there, right in the right hand top part, is a is an octave B going to a major seventh and then down to a minor seventh, like so. Right in the part of my awful sound on my keyboard here. But you have octave, major seventh, minor seventh, right? So you've got this, so, and so what you've got there is you go from this B you go to a B chord, from this B chord, you go to a, an octave, major seven, minor seven, minor seven in that particular uh, measure, which is um, measure, well, you get the idea. It's the first measure of the first system. Pardon me, first measure of the fourth system of that particular passage. Take a look. Okay, take a look at it. Okay, and what that does is that takes that B chord and turns it into a B7 chord. A B7 chord. And then that B7 chord, after that, after that you're back into the opening material of the piece. So, and you're back in the key of the major. Okay? So, what I would suggest that you have here is instead of a clear modulation to F sharp minor, is a kind of hinting around at it, and a kind of, shall we say, seven fully diminished seven of seven, uh, pardon me, seven fully diminished seven of five, of, of two in E, right, E sharp being the leading tone to F sharp, and F sharp being, of course, the two of E major, and it's also the dominant of B major, right? Which is, of course, the five of uh, the five of E. So basically, what's happening here is it, what's going on here is, and you did this quite well, actually. You've got a lot of this, uh, but I was kind of hoping, and I was kind of hoping that you'd uh, that you'd uh, that you maybe. You come up with a couple of more of these insights or these observations, but you know it's, that's the, at the same time for your for the level that you're on at the moment, you did very well. 
and uh, I was very pleased what you did. But see, now what we want you to try to do is to think deeper, to think on a larger scale, a larger scale of the uh, of the kind of, of of the harmonic implications of the overall motions of the piece, right? You go from one to five in the first big section, then five back to one in the second big section, and then how in an overall large kind of picture grand scale type film, how is that, how does it move back? That kind of thing. So we're, now that, that's not to say that in a, a truly detailed analysis of something like this, if you were to try to publish this or try to present it or something like that, you would have to go through, just for sake of complete, completion, uh, you'd want to, you know, go in there and say, ah, where are the passing homes? Where are the neighbor homes? Things like that. All the micro level that you want to you want to do as well. But it's also this large, grander scale that we'd like you to sort of think a little bit about. Okay, and this will be particularly important when you eventually take your form and analysis class uh, in a few years from now. Okay. All right. Well, uh, you think that more or less does it uh, for now? And I took up about 50, 50 minutes of your time. Hey, hey, a class time, which I'm assuming that you guys are watching, and I'm assuming you guys are looking through, and I'm assuming that you're doing, because if not, you might be missing the occasional assignment, the occasional quiz that I lay on you between now and the end of term, and if you don't do it, F on that particular Watch these things, please. Okay? All right. Until then, I, until later in the week, until later in the day or whatever, have a pleasant day. Hope you're all well. Bye. 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 Bye.